take a lot of time, um, but uh, I, I hope you know we met in the morning. I hope uh, you've been having good time throughout the day, and uh, you know we've been learning new things. I saw a lot of you asking questions and uh, learning more. Okay, so what I will do for the next, uh, let us say, 40 minutes or so, right? I don't want to take too long. I don't know how much. Like, I think a lot of time was given, but I will not take a lot of time. Yeah, I'll take about 40 minutes. And then I will try to explain something, um, you know, very different from what you have been hearing from the morning and what you will possibly be discussing in the next um, two days, okay? So, you know, as I try to explain in the morning, so one of the things that we do um, is how we apply data-driven technologies to multiple areas, okay? So I, we spoke about healthcare, and I'm sure you heard some of the um, healthcare applications and you will hear some mobility applications tomorrow, right? So, you know, in that context, right, you know, you, you see, um, you know, the data-driven technologies or the AI or ML being applied in multiple areas, okay? You know, I'm sure, you know, like, for example, all of us carry, like, AI system as a phone in, our, in us, right? We talk to Siri or Alexa or um, all kinds of things, right? Whether you go do shopping or you go on to Facebook or Twitter or uh, any of the social media or, you know, anything that we do, right? So AI kind of um, comes, you know, along with all these things. Okay, so, but today what we are going to do for the next uh, 40 minutes is to, um, you know, talk about a niche area in terms of how AI can be applied in the area of drug discovery, okay? So can someone tell what we mean by a drug? Yeah, we are not talking about, you know, the other kind of drug, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, what do you mean by drug? Yeah, what is a drug? You know, what qualifies uh, something as a drug? Medicine, yeah, okay. What else? Sorry? All right, so anything, any chemical, chemical, yeah, or, you know, any chemical that uh, can be used for diagnosing a certain disease or uh, treating a certain condition or in general or maybe supplements like vitamins and, uh, you know, other things. And also, um, you know, in general well-being of both, you know, in terms of both physical and mental health. Okay, so I'm going to take one example, one particular drug, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I don't know if you, if some of you know this, you know, of course, you know, you have seen such things in school, yeah, and maybe not after that, maybe in the first year engineering you must have seen, yeah? all right, so does someone recognize this, if not others, so someone, I'll give you a clue, this is one of the most widely used drug in the market, yeah, so if you look at um, you know, all the drugs, you could go to a pharmacy or a medical store and buy drugs, right, you know, based on a prescription or otherwise, this is the most used drug so far, I mean, if you take the cumulative. Yeah, I, I thought I heard of the name. No, no, no. <laughs> it's not paracetamol. Anyway, this, this, uh, this uh, drug is called aspirin, huh? Yeah? Okay. So, you know, what, what I'm going to do in the next five minutes is to give you a small story, right, as in, you know, because we are talking about drug discovery, right, you know, how to discover drugs. You know, you have a new disease, how do I come up with a new drug molecule, yeah? So, let's just take this as an example and then try to understand or at least try to um, see how drug discovery as a process has evolved over time. Okay. Right, so, another question. So, if you take this particular drug, right, um, so this, how, how many years do you think people have been using this particular drug? In some form or other? Approximately. So, put some number, 10 years, obviously wrong, yeah? This aspirin, you know, 50, okay, 100. What else? Yeah, let's say, you know, I have some sore throat, right? You know, my grandmother says that I have to prepare some concoction of some ginger, pepper, and boil it, drink it, yeah? Yeah, so that way this has existed for a long time. So now you can guess a number. It's more than 100. 
just put some number, no, I say more than 100, say 101 at least. No. 150, yeah, okay. 5,000, someone says 5,000, yeah. So that's not believable, is it? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. It is actually true, yeah. So this has been, you know, used in some form or other. At least we believe that it has been, the, it is under use for like 5,000 years, yeah. So and then if you look at the written records in terms of when this was used, at least 400 BC. You know, we have records saying, and of course we don't need, we don't, we didn't know this as aspirin, right? Just like I said, you know, ginger, pepper, and whatnot, right? So this was, um, you know, this particular aspirin, you know, the, not not actually aspirin, but a modified form of this particular compound. It came from this tree, yeah, the, the same tree that we make uh, cricket bass these days. What is the name of the tree? Willow, huh? so it's there. Willow, you know, when you have the cricket bats, right? So made from willow uh, tree. So, so this has been there for 5,000 years, yeah? So, and then the actual compound, the name of the actual compound is salicylic acid. Let's not worry about it. Aspirin is a slight modification of salicylic acid, and that's when, that's how we started using, um, you know, in the late 19th century. Right, so the, the drug industry in some sense started in the late 19th century, right? That people started making molecules for, you know, to be used as drugs around this time. Okay, so now how did we come up with this? Let, let's say five, three, you know, 5,000 years ago, or forget, you know, forget the story of this. Let's just talk about our, our grandmother's medicine for sore throat, right? How do you think the grandmother figured out that it's actually useful, huh? so you know, you feel very, um, your throat is strained or, you know, you have a bad throat, you know, you have some, you know, hot water mixed with honey and whatnot, it feels better, at least momentarily, right? So how do you think the, you know, they found out? Trial and error, right? So that's exactly, that's, that's what we are talking about, we are talking about drug discovery, right? So this is purely based on trial and error, just serendipity, right? You know, you just try to, you know, uh, figure out something. All right. So don't don't worry about all the details that I have here. You know, it's not very um, uh, relevant. But the idea is that um, you know, at you know, towards the end of 19th century, people started. You know, you have a certain concoction or let's say a extract from the willow bark, right? People realized it's not whole of the concoction that is working. There is one or two active ingredients in that particular concoction that is actually a medicine, right? If you just take that and leave the rest of the concoction, it still works, okay? So that's what we call drug. And then start, people started making better medicine, like, you know, people spoke about paracetamol, right? We know ibuprofen. And then there are much more advanced, um, you know, NSA IDs we call it. Again, we'll not go into the details, but the uh, people started making new molecules Right, saying, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about a combination of a large number of things, but I'm talking about a specific ingredient in that large number of things that actually works. That is the first stage of, you know, starting from trial and error, using a large concoction of different components to coming to one component. That's possibly the first, um, you know, breakthrough in the drug discovery. All right, before I go to this, so let us say I, I uh, you know, I, I have a um, headache, right? I just go take a paracetamol. I feel better, right? How do you think this works? What does it do? Sorry? Okay. Anyone else? How do you think it works? I, 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 I swallow a tablet, right? Obviously, it does something. What does it do? Yes? Chemistry, huh? What chemistry? Hey, you should know, no, you're eating something, right? It's, it's a doctor's give, but <laughs> we just trust the doctor, which is good, but, you know, what do you think happens inside? Let's say I have a pain in the knee, okay? I take parastamol, you know, how does, how do I feel better in the knee? I or ibuprofen or something. Hmm? 
so some magic happens. Sorry? Okay. 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 Right, good. So, you know, thanks. So, you know, first, firstly, you know, when we have, um, you know, maybe I have some slide later which we'll skip, but you know, when when you when you swallow a tablet, let's say, right, we are not talking about the, you know, injections, the IV or the intra muscular and so on, right? When, when you, let's talk about a simple oral um, uh, medicine, yeah? So when we take it, right? So basically we are introducing this tablet into the digestive system, right? But if it has to go to the knee, how does it go? It has to go into the circulatory system so the blood can actually, you know, transport this medicine, you know, to the other parts of the body, right? So that's exactly what he said, where, you know, the medicine, it doesn't necessarily have to break down anyway, right? So some drugs do, most drugs, drugs don't. So, you know, these drugs are absorbed into the um, uh, bloodstream, you know, by something called absorption, and then it gets distributed all over the body, right? And then what happens is that, you know, I, I would like to call any organism, including humans, as just a bag of molecules, right? You know, there's nothing else, right? You know, if, if you take any of us, we are just a large assembly of different kinds of uh, molecules, okay? So that way, you know, there are, there is a extreme diverse type of molecules that exist, okay? So, you know, how, how we, you know, the, the drug usually binds to some larger molecule, right? So let's say our system or any organism has larger molecules. The molecule that I showed is a small molecule, right? The small molecule will go and bind to the large molecule, right? And that interferes with some of the processes that are natural. So in this case, pain, okay? So there's this um, enzyme called cyclooxygenase, which is responsible for uh, the feeling of pain, right? There is other processes involved, but we don't, we won't worry about it. But is the you know, feel of pain important or not so important? It's, it's extremely important, right? I mean, pain is one of the major, um, uh, markers which tells us that something is wrong, yeah? Whether you are hurt or, you know, it could be any other, um, you know, um, conditions, right? Pain is one of the major, um, um, you know, uh, signals, right? Okay. So, but then we don't have to live with pain and hence we take uh, painkillers or, you know, other uh, things. So, anyway, so the message is this. The second phase or the next phase when you go from a larger concoction to one molecule. So the next phase is identifying this large molecule inside us, right, to which this drug binds, okay? So that's, that's what is called the target. Yeah? The, the, the drug is actually targeting some bigger molecule, yeah? So again, we'll not go into the details, but the idea is this uh, aspirin goes and binds to a larger target and that particular event is responsible for, you know, whether reduction in body temperature or, uh, you know, relieving of pain or thinning of the blood, okay? So this is something that we found later, but anyway, so just to give you one idea, I'm, I'm going to skip a few slides. As I said, I'm not going to take um, too much time. Just to give some idea of how these big molecules look like, right? So, you know, of course, this looks, you know, kind of crazy or, you know, like unstructured or, um, not so friendly to look at, right? But then if you, if you, if you looked at the structure of aspirin, right, if that has around uh, 30 or so atoms or maybe a little bit more, 30 atoms, this has maybe around 10,000 atoms, right? So it's a huge molecule which, which is made up of large number of atoms. This 30 atom molecule goes and binds to this large molecule. So that's the third kind of phase where we not only understood what this drug molecule or what this what component in this concoction is working. So the second phase is, right, how it's working, right? If it enters the body, you know, how is it working? If I, if I not only understand this, but also this, the larger molecule, maybe we can come up with better ways of discovering new drugs. 
All right, as I said, I'm going to skip a few slides. And maybe this kind of summarizes uh, um, whatever I try to explain. Yeah, so that's what I said, you know, the initially until uh, until very recently, right, recently meaning 130 years ago, it's completely empirical serendipity and, you know, it's luck, you know, trial and error. And second phase is understanding of the drug itself, right, saying, okay, this is what is responsible for treating this disease. And then the third phase is to understand how it happens in terms of binding to a target and so on. And now we talk about other levels like genomics and things like that. Okay. So now, so the question now for us is this, where is AI here? It looks like you are sitting in some chemistry or a, um, you know, um, pharmaceutical chemistry uh, class, right? But what we want to do is to talk about, um, you know, how AI can help us discover new drug molecules. Okay, I'm going to skip a um, couple slides and go to this one. Okay, so let's just look at what we mean by drug discovery. Okay, so today or in the last uh, several, um, you know, last few decades, you know, what we mean by drug discovery. So now we have a disease, let's say new or old or complicated, simple, whatever it is, right, let's say COVID-19 or whatever, right, you have a disease. What is the objective of this process? The drug discovery process is to come up with a new molecule or a drug molecule that can be used to treat this particular disease, right? So this particular process is extremely time consuming process, yeah? And, you know, cost a lot of money and also the failure rates are extremely high. So, so this is, again, it's a very simplistic, you know, the, the, the simplistic view of what is there, right? So just to tell what this is, the first stage is, you know, understanding of the disease, right? So in the early stages of the pandemic, right? So we were all stuck at home, right? So a lot of news come, you know, people um, not surviving and, uh, um, you know, genome being sequenced, protein structure being discovered, all kinds of things, right? So how are these things possible? Because, you know, this is a completely new disease and slowly we were starting to understand what this disease is, how it is caused. For example, if there is a SARS coronavirus 2, right, and it interacts with the epithelial uh, cells in the lungs. Again, don't worry about the, 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 the jargon. So basically the, you know, the, the virus particle, right, sticks on to, let's say, one of our cells in the lung, right, on the lung, right? So, and then how this virus enters the cell and then how it replicates, right? So, you know, you don't, you need only very few virus particles which actually enters the cell and then start producing millions of new viruses, okay? So this is something we have to understand, right? You have, as I said, you know, I, I at least, you know, uh, I see like organisms or just bag of molecules, right? You have a bag of molecules which is a human and you have a bag of molecule which is a virus. So when these two meet together, right? So they talk to each other, yeah? So I, I don't know, maybe uh, you'll see some uh, work later on tomorrow in the genomics, I, I, don't, I, don't, I do not know. But the idea is they talk to each other. Because the way they talk to each other, right, that leads to the disease. So that's basically what we understand by understanding the biology of the disease, yeah? So when you have the SARS coronavirus 2 and then you have a host cell, which proteins interact with each other and how new viruses are being formed, yeah? So if you understand that, right, you target one particular pathway which is crucial for producing new viruses or replicating new viruses. Okay, so now again the question is, you know, what is that we are talking about? Where is AI? Okay, so I, I did not um, complete it. So that's the first step, right? It's understanding the biology. The second step is once you have a target, which is the large molecule that I talk about, you design small molecules which will fit into this target, right? Computationally, like experimentally again. We'll not go into the details, but basically come up with a molecule, right? It's, 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 there is this um, remdesivir. How many of you heard about it? Remdesivir. Remdesivir, no? I, I'm saying it right, no? 
Remdesivir. Anybody? Hello? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Remdesivir is a molecule that, you know, that's, I think, in the second phase that was, uh, you know, it was administered pretty um, heavily, especially for the um, severe uh, patients, right? So, how did we figure out Remdesivir may or may not work? So, that's the process we are talking about, yeah? So, of course, we know that Remdesivir does not solve the problem, at least, you know, we, we yeah, at least it helped some of them, uh, 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 a small population. So, that's the next step. And then the further step is to show that it actually works at population scale, right? You know, let's say I have come up with a new drug molecule, right? So, let's assume it, um, um, you know, reduces body temperature when you are, uh, you know, when you have fever. But that should not cause some cardiovascular condition, right? You know, we are talking about very simple condition, but it should not give, you know, worse complications. That's exactly happened with some of the, um, uh, let's say, aspirin alternatives, let's say. Okay, so that's the, that's the point where, you know, there are systematic different phases of trials which are used to show that the molecule actually works and it is actually safe to be administered in humans. And if it passes through all this, you know, it can come to the market. So now the question is, where is AI? If you look at some of these works, right? So this is the whole process, okay? So that's the whole process of drug discovery. If you look at, you know, the work that has happened in the last uh, four to five years, you can see that there are multiple of these work that come out that solve specific problems in this long pipeline. Right? So, the, for example, the first one you take, right? So, some Bayesian mild machine learning approach for drug target identification. Yeah? So, if you look at the last one, like machine learning tools help predict clinical trial outcomes. Right? These two are completely different tasks. Right? So, the only thing that is common in all the things that is listed is the AI algorithms and the modern machine learning uh, methods. Okay. So, now... Um, All right, I'm going to skip. Uh, so, in terms of what's happening in the world, yeah. So, if you look at the number of startups, yeah, startups is a big uh, thing in, uh, especially in technology areas where you, you know, start a new company based on some technologies and so on, yeah. So, if you look at in two and a half years, yeah, so there's like a huge number of startups that come out in this particular area, right? It's a lot of, you know, if you look at any computer science department in any of the best computer science department in the world, all at least you will find one or two faculties working in this particular um, area. Okay, so I'm going to skip a few more slides. All right, I'm going to ask a question. Huh? So now that there's a lot of uh, talking going on, so I'm going to ask some questions. Yeah. Okay, can someone explain what this means? I, I'm sure you have done this in uh, your FMML course, some of you at least, and you may have read in your... Um, can someone explain what this means? Yeah, anyone? Just go ahead. All right, so I'm going to ask a specific question. So what do you mean by this bottom one? It says machine learning in the brackets, it, stay, it says understand, right? So what do you think it means? Uh -huh. Okay. So, what is the difference between that understand and this understand? Anyone? There are two, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, but what does it mean? Both are exactly the same, right? It says understanding or understand. What is the difference? Sorry? Um, okay. Okay. 
I, uh, there is another answer from somewhere. This side, uh, somebody was saying something. Okay. So that's basically the bottom one, right? So who is who is understanding? Machine is understanding. Okay. But what is there? The the other understand? That's human understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So. Sorry. Okay. Nice. So basically, when we talk about uh, nice, thank you. So when when we talk about machine learning or formulating new theory, it's based on historical data, right? Because when we do experiments, whether you know when we you know in a typical lab or you know we make an observation in the universe, right? That is an observation we make. That is reality, right? So let's assume that's the historical data. And based on the data, we come up with some kind of understanding. Okay, the first level that we are all used to for a very, very long time is the human understanding. Or I try to figure out, right, how things happen the way they do, right. But now we are talking about the understanding of the machine. Yeah. But is there a problem? Let's assume I I could solve. Let's assume I have a certain tasks to solve. Let's say you know, like you do assignments or projects and so on, right? So, this one person is doing the first way, that is the theory, the traditional ways of understanding, and second person is doing this, right? Which one is better? Machine learning is better. It's because it's popular. Let's assume both of them come up with the exact same answer. Which one is better? Yeah, yeah, both of them. Both of them, right? Because you know it, it, we have assumed all the experimental data is from uh, is all historical data based on which someone is sitting and doing developing a theory, and your neighbor is developing a machine learning algorithm, right? Both of you come up with the same answer. It is different for sure, but what is what is good? You know. Let's assume both it takes the same time. I'm saying both of them have exact same answer. What do you mean more accurate? I'm saying both of them give the same answers, right? So that argument is not valid. Anyone from that side? So which one is better? So, sorry? Why? No, no, I'm, I'm giving a situation where both of them have finished their work. And then they are, you know, they, they are given a task and then they came with the exact same answer. Sorry? This is from simple data for example right so unless you have interpretability or explainable uh, unless your algorithm is explainable right this becomes a major problem that's one of the reasons why machine learning is not so i should say was not so very popular at least very you know few years ago in the area of fundamental sciences right drug discovery is one of the areas where um, you know we always want to know the reason right if you say, if I ask a question and if you tell some answer, right, the next question would be, can you explain how you got this answer, right? I cannot ask this question to the machine, yeah? But then we live with this because, you know, as some of you said, like you, you and so on, um, you know, machine does it more efficiently, right? It gives more accurate answers, right? In situations where I have problems with this, Okay. In situations where I have problems with this, you know, we try to tolerate it, saying, "Okay, for now, I want some good answers, right? I will worry about explaining it later." So this is one of the areas. 
All right, so I'm going to stop in another five minutes showing you one slide or two slides. Okay, so now what is it we said? Um, the objective is to come up with a new molecule, okay, that can treat a certain disease. So let's try to, you know, simplify the problem a little. So we say, I want a molecule which has certain uh, qualities or certain characteristics, forget about drugs, yeah. So now how do we do it, right? So we keep doing experiments and then we go measure something, we make something, right? Um, and then we, it's a kind of a um, trial and error process where we do this. How machine learning can solve this problem? Let's, let's think that the, what I want is, I, so I'll stop in five minutes, um, just, just one slide. So the objective is this, I want molecules that has certain features or certain qualities, right? So the question is how can machine learning help? Right. So let us think of this pipeline, okay? So first is, I should be able to identify such molecules, saying, okay, these are the molecules which may qualify your objective, right? So that's the first step. Second step is, once I have identified those molecules, so I need an algorithm which tells me how to actually make it, right? Because, you know, we can do everything with computers. At the end of the day, it has to be done in real life, right? It's not like our phones where everything is virtual. So how do I make that molecule? And the third one is, you know, can I, can AI help in automating this, making this molecule? And the fourth one is, you know, basically confirmation. So basically what we're saying is this, you know, there's a huge pipeline where, you know, I have, you know, I have put together a certain number of different kinds of algorithms. So in this case, for example, there are four different algorithms at least four different algorithms in the simplistic case where, you know, I have these different tasks solved that's all connected in a pipeline and hence it may or may not work, but that's a active area that we work on, right? Okay, so with that, I think I will um, stop and then just, you know, stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a difficult question, right? So again, you know, AI is, is yet another tool, yeah? So, you know, we have so many ways of doing it. AI is yet another tool. So that's not going to, that's not a magic wand which is going to transform everything. That's the first response. The second response is that 15 to 20 years, it depend on, depends on what disease we are talking about, right? For example, COVID-19, you know, the market, the drug that was um, marketed was in less than two years, right? If you take some for some cancer, anti-cancer ones, they could come in seven, eight years. But you are talking about some um, you know, NSAID, for example, that may take 15 years. Yeah, typically, yeah, yeah typically. Yeah, that's the story we tell, yeah. The vaccine is very different from drugs, right? The way vaccine work is very different from how drugs work. Yes, yes, it's available in the U.S. at least, yes. Yeah, it is there, yeah. <laughs> there are, there are... Yes, yeah, basically, you know, there are, you know, there are several uh, very successful uh, AI for drug discovery startups like uh, Accenture uh, and Insilico. Both of them have uh, drugs in clinical stage um, within two years. Yeah, but how far the AI played a role? You know, we wouldn't know. Yeah, 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 it does help, yes, yes, yes. Mm.
Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's a good question. So, first of all, aspirin is only one component, which is acetyl salicylic acid. There's, there are no multiple components, right? That's one molecule. That's it. Second is in terms of safety, right? Every drug goes through, you know, the safety. Uh, you know, you know, you, you have to come. You know, you have to uh, show that it actually works, that the disease condition gets better, and then it is actually safely metabolized and excreted out of the system, and then it doesn't cause major side effects. All this is tested, you know, initially in the animal model stage and at the human level stage, and then only it comes in the market. Yeah, all these are, you know, if if they if they fail at this stage, they we don't get to buy them. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I am not so sure. I, I don't have specific examples. See, one of the um, uh, see that the two popular examples for the drug resistance. One is the HIV, and second one is the antibacterials, right? So, for companies, you know, making antibiotics is not a you know money-making thing. So, not many companies do it. HIV again, you know, we have enough drugs. You know, it's equivalent to you know diabetes now. It's a chronic condition you live with. With whatever available drugs, I don't think there's much activity there. Yeah. If it, uh, I, I, I have some slides, but we'll not go into it. But the idea is that you have this long pipeline, right? This pipeline, no. So there are hundreds of tasks within that. One of them, for example, is finding out uh, whether it is it can be taken orally, or uh, you know it will be excreted safely. Ah, huh. yes. Um, that's a very valid question, but when it when it comes to drug discovery, right? So, for example, the new drugs that come out. So this is, this statistically works. That means there may be a small population of people on whom this may not work or this will have some other effects. But most of the times, the, these exercises are done on a larger population, right? You're talking about personalized medicine and so on, yeah? So no, no, that, that genomic stage, they do that one, yeah. Okay, I think we'll stop. Thank you very much.